Hey everybody, Don Zoldai here, CEO of P3 Tech Consulting and your host for the Dawn of Drones podcast. So great to see everybody out there. Just remember we are live right now, so please tell us where you're from, drop some notes of encouragement in the chat, ask your questions, because when you hear about this company and what they're doing, you are going to have questions. It is so cool. And actually perfect for our theme this month, which is emerging leaders. So thank you so much for to the Sonoran Desert Institute School of Unmanned Technology that sponsored this entire month. And if you missed our podcast last week, which kicked off the month with the Dean of the School, John Miner, absolutely go check that out on demand. All of our episodes are on demand on Drone Life TV on YouTube. So if you haven't subscribed, do that as well. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, and we have with us here, Jordan Sicoria, the CEO of a company in Canada called Arium Analytics. Welcome Jordan to the podcast. Hey Don, thanks so much for having me this morning. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so uh, fun fact, Dan Julin, who works with Jordan, uh, was on our clubhouse last week. By the way, we'll, we'll drop that replay link in the chat at some point here so y'all can go back and listen to it uh but i met dan on i met dan through linkedin so it was one of the very first uh gigs i had was working for inner drone and i put together conference content for them uh well they had some free passes and i just lobbed out there hey anybody that wants a free pass to inner drone dm me and I never forget this person named Dan Julian DMs me and says, is this for real? Because if it is, I want to pass. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's for real. And uh, so gave him his pass and we've been colleagues ever since, kept in touch through the years. And now he's with you guys, which is really exciting. And uh, we reconnected recently when I saw what you're doing with this road bird, which we're going to talk about. So um Anyway, it's funny how how things, you know, the, the industry is so small and things are so interconnected. Uh, but Jordan, let's talk a little bit about you first. Uh, tell us a little about your background in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's actually kind of interesting. I always joke around that if uh, me from 10 years ago talked to me today, I'd actually laugh and say, no, there's no way you're doing that, that you're making that up. Um, so, you know, I have a background in a degree in management from university. I was actually in the energy industry for about 15 years. So working heavily on environmental regulations, uh, land uh, conservancy and stewardship, working heavily in forestry and the oil sands is really where this all started. But back in 2014, you know, we were looking to diversify and there was this crazy thing called drones that had started up. Um, and back then it was just kind of looking at new ways to gather new technologies, trying to understand how this whole whole thing went. And uh, I kind of leapt in with both feet. We looked early on that if we were going to do this, it was either sink or swim. And um, out of that, we kind of started this new crazy company called Arium Analytics back then. So my background in the industry, I've been running operations and working on technology advancement since 2016. Uh, been responsible for, I think our biggest claim to fame is we have over 3,000 flights actually on airport property. So not in controlled airspace, but physically working with airports, doing things like wildlife management and, and other uh, data information gathering as well. Well, before we get to dig, dig deeply into Robert and, and what you're doing with, with uh, Arium, you come from a family of entrepreneurs, is that right? Yeah, we're uh, we're serial entrepreneurs. So um, my mom actually started our sister company, the Lornell Group, back in '82, right in the heart of the oil boom. Right, well, I was actually during the downturn, um, and she kind of carved out a niche and, and came up with a crazy idea of doing land consulting and regulation work back when, again, women in the oil and gas industry was very difficult. So from there, we moved into forestry, we moved into heavy oil, we moved into GIS data management, um, and we're gonna be celebrating the 40th anniversary of that company in September. Um, moved into real estate, moved into a whole bunch of stuff. So yeah, I, uh, entrepreneurship's in my blood. It kind of, you know, the family dinner table was all talk about business, all talk about work. So I, I grew up with it, which really makes it fun for what I'm doing today. It just was something that kind of got, I lived with my whole life. 
Well, I, I love how your mom was such a trailblazer and how she inspired you. It sounds like even in your studies in school and to create your own companies and be, as you said, entrepreneur yourself, having that in your blood. So when you created Arium uh, Analytics, what was your first, like, what was the first focus? Like, what were you doing? Because you kind of alluded to the fact that drones were kind of a new thing or newer thing at the time. What what was your thought process and what inspired you to create the company? Well, the thought process there was, again, better data. Honestly, that's where this all started from. Again, being heavily involved in GIS, in data management, we wanted to find new ways to get better data for our clients and for the projects that we worked on. So drones, you know, were cheaper. It was an aircraft. Aircraft was incredibly expensive at the time. The data from satellites, you know, had that challenge of um, resolution not being where it needs to be. So we really started to look at it from the data side to support environmental reclamation work, to support forestry management work. Um, and, and that's where this all started because Back then, too, you had a bunch of mom and pops who were doing drone work out of the back of their vehicles in Calgary, and it was a safety piece for us. We grew up in a culture of safety. We grew up in that industry where it was safety first on everything we did. So that's when we were like, okay, this is really incredible. We love what drones are going to do, but we have to get into it fully. So we started as a service company back then and started providing those services in, in Northeast Alberta and in and around Calgary. Now, your initial drone fleet, let's call it, that you use, like what what were you using at the time? Because it sounds like for this land management and the data that I totally agree with you, by the way, 100 percent, you know, data is king and the drone is just a vehicle to to obtain it. And then, anal you know, right, you still need the analytics on the back end, which is part of the name of your company. Uh, so what, what, how did your company evolve from the beginning? Like what fleet did you have? And then maybe we'll get to the Rover here soon. Yeah. We started with, honestly, the first drone we ever had was an Inspire one. So DJI just trying to look at video and data collection very quickly realized that that wasn't the right tool as a mapping drone. We, uh, we then actually were one of the earliest adopters of the EBRTK. So the SenseFly, the first fixed wing, which at the time was absolutely incredible and allowed us to capture a lot of information. But the uh, the cost back then definitely was a, a skyrocketing. So what we ended up doing was getting our first one and just went to work as, as hard as we could. But that was really our understanding and knowledge based on how the drones operate and how they fly, the safety procedures and focus. We always were able to tie that in with surveying work that we've been familiar with forever. Uh, but yeah, that's really where it all started was on that side. Today, you know, we have a fleet of over eight different types of drones, fixed wings, VTOLs, um, an ornithopter, Robird, which we'll talk about in a bit here. Uh, and it's it's really expanded. And like you said, it was all about data capture, but for us, it was what you did with the data afterwards. So it was about taking all these vast sums of data, visual information, and how do you get that to your client as fast as you can in a simpler way as possible to give them the answer they need. Well, let's let's talk about that for a second before we pivot to the row bird. And by the way, everybody, just just a reminder, we're we're seeing a lot of folks out there, but no one's jumping in the chat. So we'd absolutely love to hear from you out there. Shout out, say hi, let us know where you're from. But uh, um, the analytics part of your company, like so yeah. you know, data being king, you know, collecting, you're using all of these different platforms, and presumably different sensors. Um, how were you analyzing that data and getting that client, that information quickly to clients on the back end? It was a lot of uh, analyst work. It was a lot of point and click, a lot of measurement, building out our internal processes. So um, it was utilization of probably four or five different types of software and kind of integrating them in everything from the processing to the data visualization tool. Um, but it was really about, again, trying to answer that question for people who don't have those high level GIS skills, those high level analysis and surveying based skills to present them with that piece of information. So, you know, something might take 40, 50 hours of analysis, which was still faster than what was happening at the time, because with aircraft, what would end up being is you take weeks to capture it and then it would be months to just get the reporting and the information back. Now, over time, as your 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 approach evolved 
Did you, were you able to incorporate more automation or even artificial intelligence into that process? And can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Apologies, I got some background noise here that I was not anticipating. So I'll let that run by quick. Um, actually, yeah, that was where it all started was on the manual side, but really quickly we realized same thing. Data can be automated if you've figured out those processes. So today we actually have a team of six software developers really heavily involved in computer vision and in machine learning. So what we're doing is taking that knowledge and experience that we had and automating it through. So we work really heavily in the airport space, for instance. And one of the things that we're actually creating right now is an automated regulatory compliance tool on things such as runway and taxiway markings. So instead of having to have someone sit there and a man, manually looking at an image of a runway, determining if the paint markings are in compliance or not, we actually have machine learning and computer vision algorithms doing that. now. So what that means is we have, it, it spit into the system, comes back with that report that immediately says, um, okay, your numbers are in compliance, your center lines are not, you have blur here, you have issues here. What used to take 50, 60, 70 hours is now taking two. And that's the wow. behind it. Yeah. And then on the other side, we're also creating a real-time detection tool. So things like foreign object debris, anyone who works in the airport space understands that anything on a runway you know, could be my earbuds pod, it could be a shotgun shell, it could be a Tim Hortons cup for those in Canada. Um, that can damage aircraft, that can actually kill people. But right now, people drive trucks up and down, going about 40 miles an hour, trying to see these objects, and runways are big. So what we've actually created is real-time algorithms that will allow us to fly a drone up and down that runway, and in real time, pinpoint things that should not be there, alert an operator so they can go and get picked up. And wow. so that's so, replacing those tools, yeah. That's huge. So you went from kind of forestry and some of the things we talked about, land management, to the airport scenario, which is a really impactful use case when you think about it. Um, I mean, just the, the time savings alone that you just mentioned is incredible. How is a practical matter, Jordan? Um, are, are you able to fly the drone? So do you do it? I mean, most airports are, they're almost 24-7 operations. So how do you integrate you know, kind of this drone, let's call it inspection of the runway for FOD or other things, you know, you know, while planes are trying to take off and land, like, how does that work? Well, and that's what we're working on right now is building out that regulatory process with our clients. For instance, Edmonton International Airport, fifth largest airport in Canada is one of our major partners. Um, and what we're working on right now is exactly that integration piece. So, Currently, we can work simultaneously with our traffic control and then find windows of slower time periods, shut down the runway for temporary periods of time, do the scanning and work. But what we're moving towards is the need to not have to do a no timed out or a shutdown runway and actually have it based on timing and scheduling, doing the scans and the analysis in a safe way that right now, of course, you still have to have a pilot in the mix. You still have to have someone operating the drones, but in the future, integrating detect and avoid tools, integrating understanding of flight patterns and flight paths and allowing the drones to insert themselves in those windows and get this done as fast as possible. Our goal is to basically be able to get an entire runway done in about five minutes or less, which is wow. super fast. And with the appropriate field of view, you can usually do it in one pass. So even in, in today's model, right, where you have maybe the shutdown and you're scanning, Say you find something, imagine you do. Imagine you do maybe more frequently than not. How does that work? Do you, you know, d does your drone pilot call somebody or how, because we're talking about data, you know, giving it to the customer yeah. for actionable intelligence to like do take action. So how does that work? What we're developing and it's going into beta right now, but it's a real time user interface. So Oh, wow. It will actually alert you to let you know, okay, here's what it looks like. Here's the location. Here's where you are so that the operator can actually get there and remove it in as fast a time as possible. That is so thing cool. Was, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, go ahead. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, Jordan, I could just see, you probably, I'm sure you're, you're way smarter than me. You're already visioning this future where not only is the whole process automated, but then perhaps the drone could even swoop down, pick this thing up and clear it so you don't have to still call a truck and a person to go out there and save even more time. 
Well, and that's the, the whole path towards automation that we're working towards. We have to prove that we can do this safely and effectively. And maybe it's not a drone, maybe it's a ground-based vehicle that's sitting off the edge of the runway too, but having oh, integration a little robot. Of both of them together. Yeah, yeah exactly. A little, so a little robot. Yeah. So we're, I mean, the future is gonna be incredible with this. We're proving out the safe and effective way of doing it. But in the future, that's the whole goal. I mean, our our desire is to have our autonomous solutions in every major airport in the world, um, which is a pretty lofty BHAG, but I'm, uh, I got a pretty awesome team behind me that's helping with this. Wow, very cool. Jordan, by the way, we do have a couple of people chiming in on the chat uh, before we get to Robert and some of the things you're doing with that. Um, Chris Wedgworth is, is, I'll call him maybe my number one super fan. <laughs> He's here every week and he's yelling out again from Northern California. So Chris, thank you so much. Really appreciate your support and so glad you like the show and our new ones we'll talk about later. Um, Dean Ford is coming to us from Calgary, Jordan, and it looks like he w- wants a job. So he says he's recently certified advanced RPOS pilot looking for industry flight time self-trained, spinning props for real estate construction firms. How would you suggest a newbie get more flight time for the logbook, or maybe we could connect in a follow-up network conversation? Yeah. Um, Nice to meet you, Dean. Uh, Definitely, it's all about trying to find situations where, even if it's not for paid work, you can simulate what you want to be doing. So on the real estate side, you have to be able to, of course, there's the need to work with the landowner for takeoff and landing portions, looking at safe locations to do it. But honestly, it's about finding new and novel ways to practice rather than just get your drone up in the air and get um, prop time in. If you're doing aerial imagery for construction firms, if you're looking at new and cool ways to do real estate video, you need to envision what the end product might look like. And you need to really just go out there and find cool things to fly around, to capture, to process. And that really builds your repertoire and builds out your workflow. But um, I'd be happy to connect afterwards and uh, we could definitely talk more on that as well. All right, very good. And Dean, if you're not following me on LinkedIn, I'd ask you to do that. Go ahead and DM me your email offline and I'd be happy to connect you and Jordan after the show. So uh, this is great. I love when people connect on the show. It it does happen more than you you realize um, or imagine. Um, So let's pivot for a second. And you know, we're talking about runways, we're talking about things that could be dangerous, but that really translates to some of this other work that that you were looking at from an environmental standpoint, whether it was a mining, uh, you know, kind of area that has a large pool. I know there's a lot of environmental regulations where if a bird, if wildlife goes into that pool and dies, those folks can be liable for like, tens of thousands of dollars and that piles up quickly from a from a penalty standpoint right because somehow it's it's their fault they didn't deter birds from going there and and it's not just mining it's a a number of places critical infrastructure other locations um so so tell us a little bit about let's call it the problem statement for this wildlife management portfolio you've created for yourselves and so people can better understand what the need is that is out there and how widespread that need is. Yeah, absolutely. And um, because it's in multiple industries, like you said, like the, the way we look at the problem statement is it's any time there is a negative human being bird interaction. So that could be on the tailings ponds with landings where birds could be oiled or covered in dangerous chemicals that could potentially kill them. It could be at an airport where you have migratory birds, you have flocks of birds flying around and bird strikes, right? Every, I think most people have seen the movie Sully. Uh, That is definitely a worst case scenario, but it happens more often than you think. So with certain bird species getting larger, with more aircraft in the air, with the need for mining to still be part of what we're doing on a day-to-day basis, those interactions are happening more frequently. And so with this technology, what we're doing is coming up with a new and novel way and a biomimicry based way to keep birds safe and to keep human beings safe as well. So for those that don't know, like biomimicry is something I'm just hearing a lot more of lately. I think the rover that we're going to talk about in one second here uh, is a perfect example of this. And this is where technology 
mimics something in biology, right? In, in, in the wild. And in this case, it's drum roll, please. What kind of bird does your drone mimic? My bird, a drone mimics a peregrine falcon, a female peregrine falcon, actually. You know, it's, it's a great, for, it's a great slip of the tongue you just had there, because when you look at this thing, I can understand why your brain would go, my bird looks like, we because call it, it we looks call it our like bird. a bird. So yeah. maybe, do, Jordan, is this a good time to roll the clip and you can explain yeah, a little bit about Roe Bird and then we'll talk about how you found this bird, this drone bird, and like what you're using it for. So if we could roll that clip now, that would be perfect. Yeah, so what you're seeing on the screen now is Roe Bird. Um, like we had kind of mentioned earlier, it's based off a female peregrine falcon. It's an ornithopter. So it is a flapping wing technology. There is no propellers. And as you can see, as it starts to fly away, it very much looks like a real bird in flight. And that's the entire point behind it with biomimicry is it weighs about 800 grams. So just a little over a pound. Um, current flight time and operational time is about five minutes, which is interesting. And everyone goes, wow, that's so low. But Peregrine falcons only hunt for about five or six minutes before they've depleted too much energy. They need to take a break and then they try again. Um, we often get asked why, why a peregrine falcon? Well, it is the most feared aerial predator in the world. Um, there's actually online, you can look this up, but when you look at a B2 stealth bomber profile and a peregrine falcon profile, they almost look identical. Uh, they can actually dive bomb at 300 kilometers an hour out of the sky and attack birds mid flight, which is absolutely incredible to see. Uh, so because of that, we've been able to tie into that fight or flight response. And that, um, especially with flocking birds, gulls, geese, crows, pigeons. Um, and and that's, uh, that's really what this bird was designed off of. And uh, the nice great part about it too, is it's an operational tool. There are others that are playing around out there, but a stiff breeze and they'll blow away. Um, it's swappable. We land, new battery, we fly again. You have any damage on the front leading edge wing, new wings go in, you do your checks, you fly again. The idea that we created was to have that operational ability to continue to function on a day-to-day -day basis. So the interchangeability of parts was super important for us. Well, I just remember talking to Dan last week uh, when we mentioned, you know, at the very beginning of this podcast, you know, what a small world it is. You found this drone across the world right you were at a conference was it in japan yeah and you ran into like people from your own country if i recall correctly in government and then was it netherlands finland remind me the country the origin of the the rover the company that initially created it it was initially created by uh, our partners at the time clear flight solutions and they're based out of enskede in the netherlands uh, so, yeah, we were there 2016 on an Alberta delegation to an aerospace conference to just explore what's out there. Um, quite literally had a booth right beside Edmonton International Airport. So you hear this a lot in Alberta. Um, we had to go halfway across the world to meet our neighbors. But <laughs> you your, you it happens all, not everywhere. just in Alberta. It happens everywhere. <laughs> in Jordan, so. Yeah. And then we came across this technology that was just starting to commercialize. They were trying to get it into markets in Asia. And we immediately were like, what is this? And, and we got to know the company incredibly well. Um, we brought the technology to North America with the help of Edmonton Airport. We commercialized it and brought it into airport operations very, very quickly. Um, right after that, the main reason we brought it in was the desire to reduce bird landings on tailings ponds. That was why we felt this technology was critical to, like you said, reducing oilings, saving bird lives, reducing fines for the companies. Um, and so very quickly, within probably six months from when we first saw this thing, we were the North American partners and we started to bring it in. Um, but from there, what happened in uh, 2020 was we've actually acquired the worldwide rights. So these birds are now assembled and manufactured right in Calgary, Alberta. Um, and we are continuing to drive forward with some technology advancements, which we'll talk about later. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a Alberta Canadian made product that's um, pretty impressive to watch. I, I fly it too. And every now and then I got to remember that I'm actually flying it because uh, you start to stare in awe, especially when it's gliding. 
And then it's like, oh, right, somebody needs to control this thing. So. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, just watching a, f a falcon is amazing. You know, I, I live in Colorado and we have them, I don't want to say everywhere, but we have, you know, I'll be walking my dogs and you'll, I, I just find myself, I stop and I stare and I can imagine people do that routinely, but, and as a pilot. So let's talk about that because we've got folks chiming out there wanting to work with you. Chris Wedgworth and says, now in fact, the saying, I want a job too. Um, <laughs> you know, so we'll, we'll get to, uh, we'll get to this other question here in a minute about uh, audio uh, in, in a second. Um, but it's really unique, right? Because unlike a lot of other drones right now, we, we talked about your evolution in your business with, with your other drone fleet and how, you know, you started with one, all different platforms now, highly automated, looking to eventually, right, have almost this like Uber drone in a box solution that can not only spot FOD, but maybe scoop it up, you know, someday. This this one is like a model aircraft. There's not even cameras on this bird. Is that correct? That's true. Yeah. So um, the right. skill I was going to say that you need probably to fly this thing is, is specialized. It is very specialized. Um, we've created a pretty good training program, but you're not just going to um, grab this thing out of the box and then go and fly it. I mean, again, it it's that kind of hybrid concept between a fully manual flight that you'd have on any quadcopter mixed with an RC, um, so model aircraft style. But then the other interesting piece is, again, as you saw in the video, this lands by gliding. So now all of a sudden you go from a form of propulsion, a flapping wing propulsion, which is interesting and unique in and of itself because both your, your lift and your propulsion come from a single wing flap. Then all of a sudden it's fixed wing. And now you have to ride the currents and now you have to ride the air and bring it in effectively. Wow. So it's a fantastic, really fun drone to fly. We're constantly making improvements on the ease of use, um, adding new technology and tools to prevent um, things like risk of flipping and stuff like that being reduced. And we've we made some great strides in the last year, but we're going to continue to do that as well and then get it to the point that it's a uh, Maybe not that everyone can fly it, but definitely decreasing that uh, that learning time. So when so right now you're deploying Robird essentially as a service, right? Because yeah. I mean you're not selling these directly to like an airport or a critical infrastructure, you know, mining company or something like that. You're you're saying, hey, I've got a team. We can come out. We can survey your area. We can tell, you know, with our other, do you do that with your other drones? Say, hey, here's the lay of the land. Oh, and, yeah, and, massively. Yeah, and, and then you say, and here's our proposal of, with your particular problem, we've watched the birds, we know what's happening here, here's what we can bring to the table. Is that about what you do? As it stands right now, absolutely. And it that's why we call it a drone-based wildlife management or smart wildlife management, because it's not just go up, fly the drone, the bird. Um, we use a series of other drones for habitat assessment, for bird tracking, monitoring, thermal counting, all in that bird and wildlife protection side. If you want to think about it, Rover becomes more of that kind of NORAD um, line of defense, scramble the fighter jets. When there is an emergency situation, you get Rover out to push birds out of danger zones. But there should be much more done before that. So. We, yeah, I can get into it for hours and hours, but we do a lot of wildlife habitat assessment work and support on top of what we're doing with Robert. Well, I'm going to ask the question James Standen has out there. He's also a super fan with the Before You Go, uh, by the way, has his own really cool YouTube channel where he reviews different products. So just throwing that out there, Jordan. But <laughs> um, he, he asks, have you ever thought of having Robert emit a sound like, you know, like the, the Falcon to assist with that kind of deterrence, um, you know, vibe you're trying, you're going for. We have thought about it on Robert itself, but the reality is, is that when peregrines are hunting, they're silent. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah. If they're making noise, they're probably looking for a mate. And I don't think we want to have to try and deal with that while we're trying to. No, <laughs> but, that, but that is a good question. Uh, do you yeah. have other birds that come up? Like, cause I've just seen that. Actually, I, I literally saw a falcon in my neighborhood the other day, and these little, I don't even know what they are, starlings, they're just tacking it. 
Probably you know, it was like just four of them just dive bomb in the poor falcon. And I'm like, yeah. gosh, you know, as big of a bird it is, these little ones were really nagging it. So does this happen too? It does. Um, and that to us is a perfect reason why we know this works. So oftentimes when we get into a new area, you know, predatory birds, hawks, falcons, eagles, they don't like other people coming into their territory. So oftentimes when we're first getting into an area, you have to establish a presence. And, and sometimes that means you're gonna get the resident hawk coming up and trying to flex. And so we've had some mid-air aerial battles. Uh, we never try and engage, we just try and hold our ground. And then eventually they kind of realize, oh wait, what is this thing? And it's not backing down. And then they push off and we kind of move from there. We've actually, we've been taken out of the sky by a bald eagle before. Oh, um, wow. And, and it was, it was, we flew up and instantly did not like us in the area and went after us about 15 seconds after being in the air. It was just reminding us and everyone else that this was their turf. So um, you get that sort of side. Then I think what you're talking about is probably sparrows. Um, they're incredibly fast and agile and they do this to all sorts of hawks and they've done it to Robert too. And then all of a sudden it's kind of funny, you're flying and you hear this plastic thwack and it's their beak hitting the head of Robert. And you're like, did that just happen? It's like, okay. And then they can dart in, dart out. And they're so agile that way. They do it to all larger predators. Wow. So when you talk about biomimicry here, uh, your pilot almost has to get in the head of of a falcon to fly this thing properly. I mean, so not only are you learn, you have to train folks, I imagine, on flying this very unique, as you said, you know, aircraft that with the wings that flap, but also, you know, the the kind of the nature and the reactions of a real falcon so that that it can interact properly and appropriately with other birds do you do you work i'm just thinking united states jordan and in my mind when you're talking about this and you said like you know this thing can swoop at 300 whatever miles an hour and you know sometimes there's attacks or whatever i'm thinking oh my gosh PETA, you know would you know would be all over this thing do you work with these animal rights groups to uh, help develop your programs and also to educate them on why you're doing it and that it's actually a very environmentally sound method of protecting wildlife? Uh, groups such as PETA and whatnot, uh, not yet. But what we have done is we've done a lot of work uh, with a few groups, the United States Department of Agriculture. We've done a lot of testing um, actually, larger species like turkey vultures, does Robert have an impact on a six-foot wingspan bird that really has no predators? Um, and before we could do any of those studies, we go through an entire ethics review and an, an ethics courses to understand the impacts and the strain and stress on these birds. Um, we work with the University of Alberta and their veterinary group. We've done the same sort of evaluation to make sure. Um, as we continue to grow you know, through white papers and grassroots efforts, um, we're really showing that this is a new novel way, but more importantly, it's actually a better and a safer way. Why? Because it ties into that natural fight or flight response that happens with or without humans. We're not introducing um, new cannons or noise pollution. Um, you know, at a lot of airports right now, there's still a lot of what's called depredation, or I mean, there's birds that get shot. And we want to really reduce the current ways of doing bird control by using something that has proven effective and is really ecologically friendly. So as we continue to grow um, and as we continue to transition from that service-based model into our hardware as a service model, which we can talk about in a little bit, that's critical for us is to, like you said, ensure training. Our pilots are one part pilot, one part biologist. It's not just enough to be able to fly this thing. It's not a grid pattern. You have to hunt, you have to chase, you have to herd in the air. It's the only effective tool that can vector a flock of birds and push them in a safe direction. So it's not just enough to get them up and out. If you're at an airport, the last thing you wanna do is to push them into the approach path. That that would defeat the entire purpose of what we're doing. So you've, you've got to think about that. We work with real falconers. We work with biologists. We work on making this an environmentally and ecologically friendly tool that's saving bird lives and also is improving technology and safety as well. And you're doing this not just in Canada, but all over the world. I mean, at, we talked about the airport, you know, Edmonton, but you're actually here in the United States, right? Working with, I will call it 
and some people will jump on me, but I'm just going to call it the number one state for drones, North Dakota. Yeah, we've uh, we've had a wildlife operation with the city uh, for three years. Um, they have their wastewater treatment pond right beside uh, the airport, which of course UND uses as a flight school. Some days they can be the fifth or second busiest airport in the U.S. depending on traffic loads. Um, and it becomes a full-time job. It's um, it's really safe on that side. So we've done a ton of work down in North Dakota. We've done actually live demonstrations at Chicago O'Hare Airport with the FAA. Um, and now that that uh, that pandemic that we don't talk much about is starting to um, loosen itself, now we're going to be working on getting back in and really expanding in the United States and then across the world. So, um, it, you know, I, I believe that runway you're talking about, and I could be wrong, I think they, it's shared with Grand Forks Air Force Base in North Dakota. If they don't share the same runway or portions of it, that military base is right there as well. It's, and of course, it's further west. Okay, it's further west. Yeah. Grand Sky is there, yeah. uh, right? And they're doing all kinds. Northrop Grumman, General Atomics are the two major anchors there doing incredible things. Uh, of course, we got Vantas. I mean, so the list goes on and on, and I hope I'll get to see you there. We'll talk about some of the events you're going to. And I can't yeah, believe, absolutely. Jordan, we're like running out of time. This is crazy. So um, I did want to do a, do a quick, like your, your, your birds are helping actually deter other birds from fruit farms, including in the Netherlands. Blueberry farms, is that right? Yeah, the, it, the blueberry farms, we've done trials uh, with our partners, ClearFlight, um, just proving that efficacy on agriculture. Uh, that is actually going to be an area that we're looking at next is high yield fruit farms all across the world. The amount of bird loss is in the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of damage, especially during the ripening season. Um, and they deploy everything from netting to loud emitters to pyrotechnics to um, euthanasia in some circumstances when it's too bad. So even if we could have an improvement of 10% de of decrease in the amount of loss, um, that's massive for that entire industry. So that's our next area that we're tackling is agriculture now that, again, need to prove it works. And it's not just a cool flapping wing bird that people love to fly, but it has to have an effect. And, and we've seen that. So that is what we're working on next into probably North United States and then moving into Europe again and then down into Latin America as well. Well, you talked about some percentages, and I'm going to steal your thunder for a second, Jordan, and just rattle them off quick since we're running out of time. Uh, your bird has proven to reduce at airports up to 80% of bird strikes year over year. Uh, mining reduced bird mortalities up to 70, up to 75% year over year. Uh, and your long-term goal is a reduction of mass uh, bird strikes by over 50%. So, these are incredible numbers. I can, I mean, to me, no pun intended, the sky is the limit to what we can do with this bird. You know, I can, you know, having been in the military, I can think not only Grand Forks Air Force Base and domestic, you know, domestic airspace and clearing the FOD, because that is a thing, of course, for the military to yep. domestically and overseas. Um, I can think of all kinds of really cool ways the row bird can be employed, but Let's talk about, in our last couple minutes, two things. Number one, the upgrades you have envisioned and, and how you believe Robert is going to evolve over the next couple of years. And number two, where everybody can find you. What's the next event in the U.S. where we can find you? All right, so go ahead. Tell us about the uh, your anticipated evolution. Well, and I love how you called it evolve and evolution, right? Because when you're thinking about a robot, but biomimicry, that, that's important. So um, at the end of the day, our ultimate goal is to have Robert as a fully autonomous biomimicry-based robot that uses detect and avoid and avian radar and imaging systems to track, count, detect, and then deter birds. So basically, it launches itself 
it's going to use a whole bunch of technologies to actually find those birds and then push them out of those danger areas. Um, that includes adding sensors into the eyes. That includes a whole bunch of machine learning and artificial intelligence integrations, improvements in ground control stations, and proving that we can do this all safely and effectively. So that's where detect and avoid comes in. That's where all the normal drone pieces have to be tied in with the bird tracking and deterrent pieces as well. So you're really meshing two worlds and two different types of technology together. And Dan mentioned this, and I love the name. You've got this idea of a flock box. Uh, yeah. So, you know, we all, you all heard about the drone in the box solution, you know, the, the drone can pop out and autonomously do the inspections and whatnot, like Percepto and a number of other companies have. Um, tell us about your flock box and when you think that might come online. So flock box is exactly that. It's that drone in the box concept. But for us, as you saw in the video right now, it's hand launch. So we're designing a system that can allow for a catapult launch so it can get up to speed as fast as possible, uh, integrated with a radar based detect and avoid system and an optical system as well. Um, and then it's going to actually have a bit of a shoot slash conveyor belt to land, come in, auto charge and be ready for the next piece. So these whole integrated systems it's not just robert flying but it's that detect and avoid it's that tracking and counting so you've created an entirely integrated system that will be deployable in tailing spawns in airports in agricultural settings so that they can be monitored and tracked and again keep birds safe or decrease those human bird interactions so flock boxes we're in a We've got to work with the regulators. I'm sure a lot of your audience knows, well, automated, fully automated drones aren't going to be around anytime soon. So that's why, you know, pilots are in the mix now. Then there's the step towards semi-autonomy, but still having someone with that kill switch, which is critical, and then movement forward. So our roadmap to the ultimate flock box is probably in that five to 10 year range, um, but it's not like we're not moving now. We've got our solutions coming forward. All right, awesome. And I know you've got big plans for the next year, like blitzes in the United States and yeah. raising some equity and growing your company. But where where can we find you? First of all, where can people just find you online when they want to learn more? You guys have your own YouTube channel, is that right? We do, yeah. So if you Google us on or Google Area Analytics YouTube or go to YouTube and look for Area Analytics, you'll see our entire YouTube page. You can see videos of not just Robert, but the other solutions that we're doing. Of course, we have our website, which is areamanalytics.com. Um, we're on social media, so you can find us on LinkedIn. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram. Um, and then for the Blitz, we tend to focus a lot on our industry conferences. Um, you know, we'll be going to Bird Strike USA in Colorado. There's going to be an airport uh, ACI North America conference in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, we'll be going to AUVSI again next year. Um, this year, we were there. We're just walking the streets. And uh, we're also possibly looking at CES as well. Um, so we're always attending at that. But again, we're getting to that point where we want to showcase the next generation of what we're doing. And, um, and so there's going to be a lot of opportunities to reach out and, and visit us in the United States as we grow and expand. And more importantly, uh, just reach out. We'll be happy to connect when we're moving across the U.S. and, and meeting with clients. And, and always love to have a conversation because we're really proud of what we're doing. And, and it's a pretty cool piece of technology as well. Well, I, I love what you're doing. And I'm looking at SDI's logo and, again, thanking them for being uh, sponsors this month. And you recently signed up uh, with Kerasoft as a Kerasoft partner. They're a leader, everybody, in uh, government IT solutions. They have a UAS line card uh, focused on federal, state, local, tribal, territorial governments. So shout out to Kerasoft here as well. Uh, Jordan is appearing as a Kerasoft partner today. Um, but that's great. I'm going to give you the last 30 seconds before I do some announcements at the end here, Jordan, just to kind of sum up and Anything else you wanted to say? This has been awesome. No, I, I, this has been fantastic, Don. Thank you so much. I, I've always loved being able to talk about this. Like I said at the beginning, if me from my previous career actually sat down and had a conversation with me today, I'd laugh and say that I was full of crap and I wasn't doing what we we're doing. But for us to be able to take drone technology and move it into the next generation, to be able to do not only robotics, but bringing in machine learning and artificial intelligence. You hear this all the time as buzzwords, but we're really doing it. And I have an amazing team behind me. I'm just a talking head. 
Um, but really proud of what we're doing. And uh, I look forward to hearing from everyone and uh, look forward to continue talking with you in the future too, Don. So thank you. Yeah, and I definitely want to connect, not only connect you offline uh, with Dean here, Dean Ford, but also I want to learn more about this Colorado thing you're doing because it might be up the road. And I'm just saying there might be a live stream in the future. Uh, so <laughs> I would love to like maybe link up with you guys, but what, it depends on where it is. So let's talk offline. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Great chat, everybody out there. Thank you for chiming in. People love what you're doing. They're saying, wow, they're saying, cool. They're saying, I want a job, Jordan. So uh, this has been really helpful and super, super cool product and how you've integrated into your holistic uh, environmental management program, I think is really just just brilliant. So I can't wait to see what else comes, comes out of Arium Analytics. And I really thank you. Um, I wanted to tell everybody also, please dial in tomorrow for uh, Clubhouse, 11 a.m. Uh, Mountain, 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern. We're going to have Defense Solutions. Asaf Mansa is the C CTO uh, talking about counter drones. So just another way to keep things that shouldn't be around out of the area, hear about their solution. And uh, next week also, uh, Asaf will be on this podcast, but we launched our two new platforms, uh, Mike, my producer, Mike Peel, and myself. Full crew was Monday in newscast. We had Miri McNabb from Drone Life, who kindly presents this podcast with us, and uh, Romeo Dersher from Autirion. And we also had James, Major General of the United States Air Force, retired James Poss, on our Leadership Full Tilt podcast yesterday. If you missed those, and you want to know what's happening next week, we'll have a couple of tiles here, but subscribe to us on fullcrew.io on the website, and you'll get notified when our next episodes. We've got uh, Savannah Haran from Phoenix Group. She's, by the way, was on this podcast before, is still our number two of all time. Uh, and uh, Jeremiah Karpowitz from Diversify Communications Commercial UAV News. Uh, and next Tuesday, we deviate to Twitter Spaces, for full crew with Ramon Roche from the Dr Drone Code Foundation and Ed Bucas from Votix. So busy times, busy week. It's been awesome. Thank you, Jordan. Appreciate you. Appreciate everybody else out there. We are out here.